Well, if you will, please open up your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 is we'll be spending our time here this morning as we discuss this question and thought of what is my role in the family? What is my role in the family? But before we really dig into that, I've got a, another question or idea that kind of brings into this. Is Have you ever thought of yourself as a porcupine? I know the Bible talks about us as being sheep and like sheep, but sometimes I think we might be a little bit more like porcupines. Because what does a porcupine do when it gets defensive? Prickles out. Eat all these spines. And sometimes when our problems and our issues with us, we, we tend to get a little defensive like that and put little prickles out ourselves, not wanting to let anybody get close. Get close to us to share and to find out what they can do to help. And sometimes a family can be like a bunch of porcupines in the Arctic. Imagine when it gets so cold you need to begin to huddle together for warmth. There's all those prickles. You get close, try to huddle together, but then you poke. So you kind of got to scatter away a little bit, separate away. But you get cold again, so you try to huddle back together. But again, there's those defenses are sticking out. So you kind of scatter back out, and the cycle continues over and over and over again. And in this family, in any family, you have the older porcupines and the younger ones, males and females, all trying to huddle together in Christ. But sometimes we can still be a prickly lot. I do not envy a porcupine wrangler. That's why spiritually God has designed the family to be held together by relationships, not by just a few religious leaders or elite who are there to meet people's needs, but through relationships to bind us together. It means that in God's family there are grandmothers and grandfathers, mothers and fathers, single people, married couples, sons and daughters. We're all here to help one another grow. So keep that in mind as we we move in this morning to the idea and the talk about what is my role in the family. So we're going to begin Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so they may encourage their young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible in all things. Show yourselves to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Poor Titus, a young man put into a, a unique position, a place that there is a, a multitude of problems. He's sent to a land that he's not probably quite familiar with, a unique place, Crete working with new converts, people brand new to the gospel and to the word, he's sent there for a couple different purposes. One, the primary one, was to put elders in, to help these churches grow. And in this, he's still dealing with, as a Cretan prophet or poet says, that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. He's dealing with some rather difficult people. And yet Paul gives him instructions that are found, that said that are fitting for sound doctrine to help them grow, to help get these people out of that rut, out of that stereotype, and into a loving family to cut away the prickles in their lives and become that close-knit family. So another quick caveat for this. I am not going to define here who is older 
and who was younger. I'm going to let you pick that for yourselves and determine that. I know some of us claim to be young at heart, and that's, that's good. But while I address each group separately, that opposite group, please pay attention and listen, because while I'm talking to the olders, youngers, you're going to be in that older position someday. And olders, look down, because the rest of us are looking up at you. Keep that contact with us. So as we begin with the older generation, as it said, we start in verse 2 through 3, talking about this older generation, beginning with the older men. It says, older men are to be reverent in their be- or uh, are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith and love, and perseverance. He gives very many characteristics here. As older men are tend tended to be looked at and saw as the leaders, leaders of the family and the flock. The ends was saying, be temperate or self-restrained. These men tend to be the leaders, as I said, in, in roles, put in those roles, and they face the tough decisions, the tough things in life. And sometimes it's easy to let our emotions get the best of us. You've seen throughout your life so many times, or probably lived it, so many times that things have gone wrong, and yet all you want to do is to reach out and to help them not make those same mistakes. And sometimes we, the youngers, can be a little front in our actions and things, and I've I've been told before that sometimes all they wanted to do is just get a club and just kind of beat it into you, stop it, stop it, stop it. But that's not what he's saying here. He's saying, hold back. Be self-restrained. Do what you can to help them through those tough mistakes, but let them still grow and take their lumps as it comes. Remember, the upcoming generations, we're, we're learning. We're watching. We're, some of us are actually literally taking notes about how you handle these challenging decisions and actions that come. Because that's how we are probably going to take those and handle them in our future. He says, be dignified. Be dignified in your actions. These men, these older ladies, they're to be honored in their age and in their wisdom. And that's going to be reflected in your actions. Be dignified. Hold yourselves up. Be ready to stand. Be like the ruler. Firm in what you've done and what you say. Hold fast. Don't back down. If you're in facing those tough decisions, stand strong. Stand up. Stand right. Be sensible in your actions and decisions. This is, we'll come to this again, but this word is used to describe every single group here. Be sensible in your actions and decisions. Remember and reflect on what we're doing and what you are doing. They're going to show an understanding of how Christians need to live, act, and lead, and how these older men are showing all of us what it looks like to be leaders. And when you are sensible in your actions and decisions, it shouldn't come to a surprise to anybody the decisions you're making, the things you're acting and doing, because it's who you are 24-7. Be sensible and sound in your actions and decisions. And then lastly, be sound in faith and in love and in perseverance. These men that we are looking up to, it's here in the physical realm. That's a wonderful thing, because when we look through the Bible, we can read about all of these heroes of great faith. Men who show a mighty love for God and strong patience towards those who are doing wrong to them or to those younger ones who are learning. We learn so much from those great characters. But there's still something to be said about the living act that's right before us. You can read and learn all you want there, but actions speak so much louder than words. It's said that you can learn and read 
master something all day long in this, but it's not real until you've experienced it. It's not real until we've actually been able to see how you older men are leading and helping us to grow. Well, then he moves into the older ladies. It says, Older women likewise to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. I love that word, likewise. And we're going to see it again because it's a word of comparison. And what he's saying here is that older men, that beginning part, older men, you're to be these things. And older ladies, you're also to be these things, to share those same characteristics. And older men, you're following the same ones that the older ladies are doing. You're sharing together. He separates a little bit, but we're still sharing and learning together. He says with the older ladies, be reverent in your behavior. Be respectful of how you act. Because remember, there are a lot of watching eyes. There are a lot of people looking at your examples. And he says, do not be malicious gossip. So I think we have a good understanding of what a gossip is. But he moves on to that and gives a harder description, a malicious gossiper, one who is out to seek and purposely cause ill will and, in, and content. You're looking to break things up to poison the well. Don't be like that. Don't share these awful things that are there to, to hurt, to prick. Remember, a porcupine's quills carry some poison in them. Don't let the poison out. Don't be prickly in that nature. Trim the pricks that are in your life. Trim those off. Trim the needles. In fact, I love what he says in Ephesians. Look over to Ephesians chapter 4. He talks about this, this idea of gossiping. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the needs of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Some would argue and say that the tongue is the most powerful muscle in the body. Because not only does it help with, that di with the digestion and breaking up foods, but it's how we, it's one of the major forms of how we communicate. It brings across that message of what's in our heart and in our mind. It's a powerful, powerful tool that can be used to build up or to break down. He gives such strong encouragement here. Don't use it as a tool for tearing down, but use it as a tool to build up, to help everybody grow. Well, then he talks about, do not be enslaved to much wine. So we can take that at face value. Obviously, do not take yourself to much wine. In this case, be aware of alcohol and the things that can come from that. But I want to dig a little deeper and add a little an extra level of application here for that. And it's being sober-minded. When he says, do not, do not be into much wine, he's really saying, be of sober thoughts and mind. And remember what he says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, for your adversary the devil roams around like a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour. We are to keep so vigilant for all these things, especially because people are watching. And if we allow for ourselves to become distracted or dictated by the things in the world, we're going to lose our edge and our influence. That's why any time you hear Paul talk about leaders and what it means to be a leader, or the characteristics of a leader in the church, or in general, one of those key points is keep away from things that are going to take that edge away. Be sober. And then lastly is teach, 
teach good, teach what is good. Both teaching and by living as a Christian should be, people are going to be watching and remembering. Our young people, your co-workers, your friends, your family, so many are watching and are learning. We need to make sure that we're acting and living like Christ does. Well, then Paul is shifts the focus again. Your, book, your version might say, his mind does likewise or so that. And again, it's that phrase of cause and effect, of what's coming, a purpose statement. He says, so that they may encourage. Encourage the young. Older generation, you are to be living in all these ways that Paul has described so far because we youngers are watching. In fact, a good illustration, a good example is this. is uh, You might remember the, movie, the Incredibles 2 movie. When Mr. Incredible leaves little Jack Jack with Edna for the, for the night, he comes back later the next day, and you've seen a drastic change in his behaviors. Little Jack-Jack is now copying Edna in almost everything. He's walking around using his, carrying his lollipop like she does her cigarette. He's walking as she does as they go down the hall. He's using all the same gestures. He even got to the point where she goes to the keypad. He, she lets him take care of everything because he has learned and he has emulated all the things that she has done and taught him in the last roughly 24 hours. Now that scene and that's meant to get many great laughs out of it, and I remember laughing at it when I first saw it. But when sitting back and reflecting on it, it brought some sobering thoughts and reminders because little ones and young ones watch, learn, and emulate. And you're going to hear me say this over and over again because that, that's the major point for this morning is your example for both sides. We're watching, growing, and learning. Well, then he moves, as said, into the next section, talking to the youngers. So, youngers, you might have relaxed a little bit. Now it's time to pay attention, because that's it's your turn up to bat. So the younger generations, he kind of has meld them together a little bit here. Uh, with the young women, the, into the olders, and even the young men into the younger women. And I want to begin with the first statement, a very powerful one here. It says, encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. You might think that's just kind of one of those duh moments. Something that it would come as common sense, that we should make sure that we're loving our husbands and children, but he's giving us a, a story strong steady reminder to these people here because they've been struggling with these things remember what the prophet said they're always liars evil beasts and lazy gluttons they were struggling to show and to find to remember their love it's a healthy reminder to all of us showing love is important and while he directly addresses the young ladies here Young men, we are not, I say we because I'm speaking for me out of anyone else, we are not exempted from this. That word likewise is there. shows up in verse 6 for the young men. Love. Love your wives. Love your children. Love your families. So I have a quick, uh, quick homework assignment, I guess, or, or, or idea for the young ones. For starters, will all of the married couples... We've been married for 35 years or more. Please raise your hands. Hi. Raise them high. 35 or more. Okay. Keep them up. Keep them up. All right. So, younger couples, those who've been married for five years or less, your hands up. Okay. I see a bunch over here, some over there. Awesome. Look at all those older raised hands. Go talk to them. Go get close to them. Interact with them. Go to dinner. Go over to their houses if they'll let you. Watch how they interact with their kids, with their grandkids, with all these other miscellaneous little ones that run around here. And learn from them. 
They are the greatest examples that we have here to learn and show and see what love is. Because you aren't married for 35 years plus for just any reason. There's a formula that's worked for them. Learn it, master it, because those 35-year-old married anniversary set couples are becoming scarce. They're becoming scarce. And I know for, for myself personally, I want to become one of those couples that can be an example for an upcoming generation on what it means to be a loving husband, father, and a family unit. Please, young couples, make those tight relationships and bonds. And help us, olders, as olders, help us to make those bonds with you. And of course, I've been speaking about young married couples, and there's a group here that still needs to be addressed. The singles. You're also not excluded in this. Love your husbands, love your children can still apply to you. Whether you're building it yourself up for a potential future or even watching and learning how those married couples work, you're still going to see what love really looks like and how you can apply those things in your life as you deal and interact with everyone else's kids and your siblings and your close friends. Build those same relationships. Be those supports for one another and supports for your married friends. I know there's many singles here that have done a great job of being that amazing support system for your married friends, helping, your, helping with their kids, both here at service, outside of service. It's noted. We see it. And I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for doing that, because you help us who are upcoming to hopefully have families those who do have families, to know that there are people here who are going to love your kids just as much as you do. And as I said, that word sensible shows up multiple times. It shows up once for the young ladies directly. Verse 5, it says, to be sensible, pure workers. And the first thing he says to the young men in verse 6 is, likewise, urge the young men to be Sensible. And not just sensible, but he says, be sensible in all things. That's because, well, we don't have the same experience that the older generation has. Sometimes what we might think is a good idea turns out to be a big stinker. And we need that same help and guidance along to help make sure that those stinkers of ideas don't ruin our lives, both physically and spiritually. But be sensible. Look around again at the examples that you're seeing and emulate those sensible actions that the older generation is giving and is showing. Emulate what you see. Then he says, be pure and have purity in doctrine. As I've mentioned over and over again, old generation, you carry lots of influence and examples, but youngers, you do too. You have a strong influence in this church family, in your own families, and with all of your friends. And you know what? The old generation is also watching you. They are learning from us just as much as we are learning from them. And a lot of times what they're learning is how they can help us to get back on the right road of things and how to help us become sensible again. And when he talks about purity and doctrine, this is, again, as much for me as anyone else, and I wish I had done this at an even younger age, but to the young, study, study, study. Talk. Discuss among yourselves, among the older generations. Learn what the Word has to say. 
and grow closer one another, the olders and with God. Because just like the old generations, we are called to teach and to preach to the world. And we need to make sure that we are firm in our convictions and understandings, just as they are, because we're called to do the exact same things as they are. And then we're given one more powerful command here. And it's listed with the young women, but it's just as applicable to the young men. See, be workers at home. And while a lot of times that's directly called out and people say, well, women need to be stay-at-home moms, need to be focusing all their time and effort on the home, I, I'm not going to argue and say that you need to. I have, I have no problem with a woman who would like to have a, a career. But remember what your major focus should be in your life. Youngers, olders. Home. Home is so important. Because home is where we are proving and showing that we are living that life in Christ. As I'll borrow a phrase from Ricky, the proof there is in the pudding. That is where we really show what we're doing. Because when we're here together, we're, we're only here together in this family for three, four hours out of a week. And you're going to see a little bit of growth and change at that time, but you're really going to see it when you're separated at home amongst yourselves or having friends and people over. That's where you're going to see the real growth and the real change in your life. Work at home. And again, speaking for me, men be workers at home. When we get home from work or we get back, let's not just go sit in our easy chairs get into the other distracting things at life, but remember you have a duty at home to your wife, to your kids. You are an example as well, and they're not going to get as much time with you as they are hopefully with the mom. That's why it's more important for us to be those workers at home, for them to see and understand and learn the examples. Be workers at home. And then both sections for these young end with this thought. So that the word of God will not be dishonored. Say that for the young women, for the young men. It says the opponent will, not, will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. When we bring all of these characteristics here that we've discussed, seen, learned about, that we learn and see and learn from the older generations, we're going to bring honor to ourselves. Because the name of the God is going to be shining brightly in our lives. So I said there's really only one big application I wanted to bring for this morning, and that's this, is we are to be examples to one another, to learn, to watch, and to grow. Older generation, you are veteran soldiers. Some of you literally, but you are veteran soldiers in the spiritual war. You have seen so much. You have learned so much. And when you look and sit down for war council, it is the older generation that's doing the planning, the strategizing, because they've been there. They've done it, and they've learned how to minimize these spiritual losses. But invite the younger ones in still. How else are we going to learn and grow and how to fight those same battles? And while they let us in, be open-minded still to maybe some new ideas or thoughts from the younger generation. Because you're going to be sharpening our minds. Sharpening what we know and what we need to know to help us become those veteran soldiers. And when the time for battle comes, be like the amazing generals that we see in history. The ones who really made an impact aren't standing in the back. 
but they're standing on the front lines, ready to fight and to defend. The younger generation, do your best to gather around those veteran soldiers. Listen to their stories, to their examples, to their advice. For all the things that they have to share in their lives. Because they're not going to direct you down a path that's going to destroy you. They want to see us and see you grow and become mighty warriors for God. And younger generations, do not be afraid to share your feelings or ideas with the older generation. Because not everything is going to be gold. And I promise you, most of the things that we're going to bring to the table, they've thought of before, they've heard before, and they're going to help us and help you determine which is the right and best paths to take to grow and grow. And another reason that we need to share is because sometimes we do strike a good hot idea. It may not have ever come up if you've never had the confidence to speak up and to speak out. And lastly is this, is while the veteran soldiers are standing on the front lines, go and stand with them. They are your shield mates. They are your brothers and sisters in arms. Stand together. Lock shields together. Learn from one another because we are a family. We are a family. That is the most important thing. We all have different roles in the family. Some is to teach. Some is to grow. We all stand together in this. I love using songs as illustrations. And I found one that really helps to, I think, emphasize and to solidify what we've talked this morning. And it's one from VBS. So many of us should be familiar with it. I'm not going to sing all of it. I can try not to sing any of it if possible. But it's that song, Be Careful. It says, Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Because there's a Father up above looking down in tender love. Be careful what you do. When we sing this song, we're normally ref referring to our kids and our young ones, that their little eyes are watching and learning, but it's true that all eyes are watching and learning and growing. And not only those who are just sitting in this room now, but everyone in the world is watching, looking, and seeing. Who are you? Are you really living as one of God's children? The world is watching to see how we react and act to events in our lives. Let's do our absolute best to emulate what Paul's encouraging words here for, for Titus are to help these brethren grow to become a better spiritual family, to learn how to cut away all those sharp, pointy spines that we, the porcupines, can carry. And if you're ready this morning to, to become part of this family or to come back into God's family, we offer this chance now as we stand and as we sing.